Well, thank you, worship team. Good morning, church. It's great to see you guys today. My name is, yeah, you can cheer. That's exciting. Uh, my name is Ricky Hemi. I serve as one of the pastors here. I have the privilege of filling in for Pastor Matt. If you read my Friday emails, then you know that Pastor Matt is down at UCLA checking in his son, Jack. You might notice that Pastor Matt, oh, never mind, he's here. All right. Let's welcome Matt to church. I'm glad he didn't ditch us today. All right. Well, I was going to encourage them to pray for you and for Wendy because uh, Jack is at UCLA. You might notice that all of a sudden he's having a, he's having like an affection for California that's growing on him, which is exciting to see. And, uh, but you got to pray for him and for Luke as they're adjusting and Wendy as they're adjusting. They got one more in the house. And so you guys are on our mind. Pray for them. Uh, yeah, so good to see you guys today. I have the privilege of exploring a passage of Scripture written by one of the most beloved figures in the entire Bible. His name is David. King David, as you may call him, was a passionate and courageous man who lived an epic life full of adventure. If you've ever read any of his stories or any of his Psalms, then you know that he was a man who lived a life that was anything but boring. It was filled with epic ups and downs, glorious triumphs and dramatic failures, unprecedented prosperity and unrivaled despair. His victories like the defeat of Goliath are legendary and his sins like adultery with Bathsheba are scandalous beyond comparison because whatever David did, he did with his whole heart. Well, David serves as a wonderful lesson about the triumphs and tragedies of life, which is something I think we all know about. We know that this world is full of ups and downs, triumphs and tragedies, good days and bad. But today I want to focus in on one thing from David's life, and it's how did David deal with discouragement? How did David handle the downs, the lows, the struggles of life? Maybe today you came in here to this church discouraged, desperate for some kind of hope. Maybe today you're anxious. Maybe today you're burnt out with life. Well, I want you to know you're not alone. I've been in ministry for over 11 years and I get to minister to people on a weekly basis. And I could tell you, I talk to person after person who goes through seasons of discouragement. You're never alone when you find yourself in a season of discouragement. And one way I also know that's true is because even David had seasons of discouragement. In today's passage, David finds himself in the middle of a weary and discouraging trial. He's been thrown into the furnace of suffering. And when we find ourselves in this furnace, with all of its heat and all of its pressure, we need to remember that the flames are only capable of two things. Number one, they can destroy us if we allow them to. Or number two, they could strengthen and purify us. Now, it's no secret that all of us will go through the furnace at some time. The furnace comes for every time, for everyone. And sometimes when the furnace comes, it's just a low simmer. But other times it's a raging inferno. I don't know where you're at today. Maybe today is rainbows and butterflies for you. And I praise God, I'm excited for you. But maybe today you're like, man, I'm in the furnace. The question is, how are you going to handle this furnace? How are you going to deal with the trials? Will the furnace destroy you or will it make you stronger? Today, I want to show you how to deal with life's discouraging seasons in a way that produces hope in a sermon I've titled, When Life is a Furnace. Please turn with me to Psalm 63 in your Bibles. And as you turn there, I'm going to go ahead and pray. 
God, I thank you so much for the people in the room this morning. I pray that you would fill each and every one of us with the hope that you're always there. I pray that we would never be tempted to think that we're alone, that we'd never be tempted to think that you're done with us. I pray, God, for those who are struggling and suffering, that they would find hope and strength today, hope that could carry them on into the future. And I pray that you would use their stories for your glory. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 63. It says, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I'll bless you as long as I live. In your name, I'll lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed. And meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They'll be given over to the power of the sword. They'll be a portion for the jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. And all who swear by him shall exult. For the mouths of liars will be stopped. Psalm 63 gives us four ways of dealing with the discouraging seasons of life. Number one is, when life is a furnace, seek God. Listen to what David says. He says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David compares the season that he's in to a, a, a weary traveler who is desperate, fainting for water. That's how he feels. Now let me ask you, have you ever been like super, super thirsty? Have you ever gone to bed super, super thirsty? And maybe this just happens to me and you dream throughout the night that you're drinking water. And then you wake up super, super thirsty because it was just dreams. Or is that, is that just me? Or have you ever participated in hell week of football in the AV? I know Luke has been there. If you've done that, you've been super, super thirsty. Or have you ever lived in the desert before? If you've lived in the desert, you know what it's like to be super, super thirsty, to be parched. We live in the AV. We understand thirst. But have you ever felt spiritually parched? Feeling spiritually parched is feeling like your spirit is thin and your soul is weary. Life has made you tired and you're thirsty on the inside. You're thirsty the moment you wake up and you're thirsty the moment you go to bed. And you could be surrounded by all of the amazing things that life has to offer. And even with all of those amazing things, for some reason, still in your heart and in your soul, you're thirsty. You're discontent. You're wanting something more and you can't figure out what it is. You're tired. You're weary. You're burnt out. Well, that was David. He said, my soul thirsts for you. Now I find this metaphor to be fitting because in the context of Psalm 63, David is literally withering away physically and spiritually in a desert cave. You see, the context of Psalm 63 is David fleeing in the wilderness. 
If you look at the beginning of the psalm, it has a description. It says, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. To get a better idea of what's going on here, you'd have to turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel 15. And what's happening in 2 Samuel 15 is that David's son Absalom has rebelled against him. And he's forced his father out of the throne and he's seeking to take his father's life. And he does this first by stealing the hearts of the people. He sits at the city gates and he hears them out and he steals their hearts. And then he sets himself up as the new king of Israel. And then finally he plots to kill his own father. And this plot by Absalom is so heartbreaking to David that as he escaped the city, we read in 2 Samuel 17, that he went up the mount of the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. The great and mighty warrior, King David, escaping his own city, fleeing from his own son, weeping barefoot and with his head covered. And we read that others followed and all the people who were with them covered their heads and they went up weeping as they went. Psalm 63 is a time of deep, Deep, deep sadness for David. And it's not a small trial. His son rebelled against him. He's been forced out of his home. His friends are mocking him. His enemies are seeking to kill him. And he's living in a cave. Now let me ask you, how would you respond to God in a furnace like that? How would you respond? Would your faith survive a furnace like that? What would you utter to God with your lips? Would you seek God as David did? Or would you curse him? You know, I was recently reading about Job's life. You guys have heard about Job, great character from the Old Testament. Job literally lost everything. Everything that was dear to him, all he had left was God. And in the midst of the trials and in the midst of the sufferings, one thing that really convicted me was the fact that Job never cursed God. In losing it all, he never cursed God because men like Job and men like David believed that God was in control of everything. They believed that God wasn't just sovereign over the good times, but that he was even sovereign over the hard times. And so Job, when he's processing everything he's losing, and he's wondering why is this stuff happening, and people are tempting him to curse God and die, Job says with his lips, shall we receive from God? For, uh, shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. If your response to life's furnace is to curse God, then the furnace of life is already winning. But if your response to life's furnace is to seek God, then you will surely find help. You see, when David was weary and afflicted and at his absolute lowest, He sought God. This first point is a reminder that only God can satisfy the empty feelings of discouragement. Turning on him is not going to help. Ignoring the situation is not going to help. Only God can satisfy the empty feelings of discouragement. And that's why Jesus says when he came to earth through his earthly ministry, he says, if anyone thirsts, you thirsty out there? You feeling weary? You feeling run down? You feeling discouraged? If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus came to save weary souls. Jesus came to sustain broken hearts. 
Jesus came to refresh the downcast. Jesus came to give life eternal. And he says that the water he provides will not only fill you up, but you'll have so much pouring out that you'll be able to help fill others up around you. The first way to handle discouraging seasons is to seek God. The second way, this one might surprise you. I know it surprised me, is to praise God. This is what David says. He's in the middle of this trial, rotting away in a cave. And he says, so I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I'll bless you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. This point, point number two, praising God, even when it's hard, to me is the sign of a true believer. You see, it's a common thing to seek God in the midst of trials and tribulations. Okay, even atheists call out to God in their greatest time of need. It's common for people to call out to God when they're in the furnace and the flames are hot and they want to escape and they want to get out as fast as they can. But you know what's less common is to worship God even in the flames. You see, that's the mark of a true believer. A true believer always has room on their lips for the praise and worship of God. No matter what they're facing, And so let me ask you, when life hurts, can you still worship God? Even when the suffering doesn't seem to stop, can you still worship God? Can you still praise God? Because listen to what David says. He makes three I will statements in this psalm, in that section. He says, I'll praise you, I'll bless you, and I'll lift up my hands. I'll praise you, I'll bless you, and I'll lift up my hands. You know, last week we heard Pastor Matt mention a guy named John Bunyan. You guys remember that? John Bunyan is a famous author, uh, author of the book, The Pilgrim's Progress. If you haven't read it, I recommend reading it. It's an amazing book for all ages, an allegory about the Christian life. John Bunyan wrote that book during one of his stints in prison. And if you don't know about John Bunyan, he was a Puritan preacher from the 1600s. And he was a passionate preacher. In his 20s, he would preach and thousands and thousands of people would come and listen to him, even in his 20s. And there became a conflict with the church in England during that time. And John Bunyan was told that he needed to stop preaching or he'd be sent to prison. Well, instead of stopping preaching, Bunyan chose to get locked up. And he wasn't just locked up for a short amount of time. You know how long he spent in prison? 12 years, 12 years, he sat in prison just because he was unwilling to stop preaching. And during that time, he wrote some of his greatest works like the Pilgrim's Progress, but he also penned journals. And one of his journals talks about how he dealt with suffering in chains. And he said this, he said, I was made to see that if ever I would suffer rightly, I must first pass a sentence of death upon everything that can be properly called a thing of this life. Even to reckon myself, my health, my enjoyment, and all as dead to me. The second was to live upon God that is invisible. You see, men like John Bunyan, they didn't fight to escape suffering. He could have escaped it at any time. All he had to do was say, I'm done preaching. They didn't fight to escape suffering. Instead, they actually embraced it. What does James say? Consider it joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. You see, no one in the Bible, including John Bunyan, a guy outside of the Bible, and no one in the Bible liked suffering. No one likes suffering, okay? If you hate suffering, that's a good thing, okay? You shouldn't like suffering. But you know what the joy comes from? Knowing that God's going to do something with this suffering. 
The joy comes from knowing that God's going to teach you something in this season that he couldn't teach you in any other season. Because sometimes the suffering teaches us more about ourselves and more about God than the, than the days of ease. And I just got to be honest with you. I hear stories like John Bunyan's and I can't help but ask, why? God, why would you let this happen to him? Why didn't you break him out of jail sooner? He had a young family. Why didn't you do a miracle and turn things around in England? Why did you allow him and other servants of yours? Why do you allow your chosen servants to endure hardship? Why do you endure hardship? Why do I endure hardship? If you're reading the book of Acts with us, studying the book of Acts with us, you might be wondering with Paul, why? Why is he stoned? Why is he beaten? Why is he mocked? Why is he in chains? What good could come from this? Bunyan answers this question for us. He says, we're apt to overshoot in the days that are calm and to think ourselves far higher and more strong than we find we be when the trying day is upon us. We should be overgrown with flesh if we had not our seasonable winters. It is said that in some countries, trees will grow, but will bear no fruit because there is no winter there. Bunyan's answer, the short answer, is that the winter grows us. The hard times strengthen us. Paul's winter brought him before the emperor. Bunyan's winter sealed his name in the history books. And your winter is capable of producing a crop bigger than you could ever even imagine because the winter can grow you if you allow it. The winter can grow you. I was reading an article about plants this week because I was just wanting to follow up on that point. And I learned that there are many plants that if they don't have a hard, rough winter, they actually can't, they can't grow in the spring. There are many plants that need winter in order to grow. And sometimes we need winter in order to grow. I, th I share this to point out that sometimes the hard seasons are more important for growth than the easy seasons. Winter grows us, pruning builds us, the furnace purifies us. And we learn more about God and about ourselves in the season of suffering than we do in the season of ease. The question is, can you praise God even when it hurts? David says in the midst of this storm, so I'll bless you as long as I live in your name, I'll lift up my hands. And believe it or not, praising God is one of the fastest ways to, to cure the discouragement of suffering. When you can learn in the flames to worship God, you will see that the anxieties and the fears of life begin to melt away. Because nothing glorifies God more than maintaining our stability and joy when we lose everything but God. Are you discouraged? Seek God. Are you discouraged? Praise God, even though you're discouraged. And number three, remember God. Listen to what David says. He says, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. I think we're frozen here. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you've been my help and in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. You know what I realized when I studied this psalm is that sometimes the best way to take your mind off of the present is to remember good things from the past. Sometimes that's the best way to deal with discouraging seasons. Now, uh, and it made me think of something. Have you ever been driving in a car when you heard an old song come on the radio? And the moment you heard that old song, you were teleported to the past? Has that ever happened to you? 
And you could just, you're just, you're just there. It's so vivid. You hear that song and it's like, oh my gosh, that was me with my buddies in the car. Or that was me at the skating rink or what, I don't know what you did. Uh, that was me at the mall. That was like, you just, you're there. That, I heard that song and I think of my mom. Or maybe it's a smell. You smell a certain food and you're, you're just teleported to your grandma's kitchen. There are certain smells and sounds that do that for us. Okay, so I, uh, I just picked up, my, my daughter was, was hanging out with my mom the other night. And I picked her up afterwards and she was wearing a shirt from my mom's house. And, and my stepdad's here right now and maybe it was his shirt. But she's wearing this shirt and she comes home, she's clean and stuff. And so I just had to tuck her into bed, pray with her, do all that stuff. And I, I lay her in bed and I give her a hug and I give her a kiss and I smell the shirt and immediately it smells like my mom's house. And I was just transported, just through a single smell, transported back to my childhood. There are certain smells that do that. My favorite smell of all time, you might think this is weird, but it's true. My favorite smell of all time is two-stroke exhaust. Best smell in the world, okay? If I could get a candle of two-stroke exhaust, cologne of two-stroke exhaust, Air freshener of two, I would be living in, the only reason I can't live in it is because it would kill me. But I, otherwise, I just love two-stroke exhaust. It's the best smell in the world. It reminds me of my childhood, racing motorcycles, some of the best memories with my family and friends. Two-stroke exhaust. Maybe your thing is the smell of pumpkin spice during the holidays. You love your pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks. Can I get an amen at least for that one? Okay, yeah. Or maybe it's the smell of pine during Christmas. We all have these smells that bring us joy, that, that teleport us back in time. Well, you know what? I think that's what was happening with David. You see, David was in a cave in the wilderness. Was that the first time David found himself in, the, in a cave in the wilderness? No. You see, I think that the musky spirit smell of that cave and the sound of voices echoing off of the walls in that cave began to fill David's mind with memories of God from the past. And this event is happening late in David's life. And so this means that David has a whole history of, of memories, times where he went through hard troubling season, seasons. And you know what he knows about God is that every time he was in a hard spot, what did God do? God helped. God came through. David fought the lion. God was there. David fought the bear, Goliath. David was surrounded by the Philistines. David fought against the Ammonites, the Gibeonites, Saul, the surrounding kings. No matter what David went through, God was always there. What makes him think God's not going to do it again? If you're in a discouraging season, you're going to be tempted to think that God can't do what he's already shown you he can do in the past. You see, odds are if you're discouraged right now, you've been there before. And maybe the trial that you're in right now is the exact trial you were in 10 years ago. And you know what God did back then? He came through if you sought him. And so if God has a history of coming through, why won't he come through for you again? David was not unfamiliar with these trials. He had been there before and he knew that God always helped and that God would do it again. And odds are if you're discouraged, this isn't the first time. How has God helped you? Because he could do it again. Remembering God's faithfulness is critical when dealing with discouragement. And I just got to say, part of the reason I wanted to preach this passage today is because I'm actually in a season of life where I'm discouraged. I've been discouraged because I've been dealing with just nagging injuries from my past. And I had surgery on one this summer and I'm about to have surgery on another this winter and, and maybe as early as next week if I get my spot on the cancellation list. And, and the pain of nagging injuries is one thing, but the, the issue for me that causes discouragement, and, and this just shows my own weakness, but the issue for me is, is when these things 
steal your life, right? No more running with the kids. No more wrestling on the floor. No more cycling. No more CrossFit. No more hiking mountains with your friends. Those are the things that can destroy me. That have, over the past few months, started to destroy me on the inside. And it's caused me to be down and and discouraged, really down at times. And when I'm at my lowest is when I remember that I've been here before. You see, this is not the first time, not even close to the first time that injuries have isolated me. This is not the first time that I've been laid up. And what I know about God is that God got me through the past ones. Why won't he do it again? Maybe today you need to remember God. David says, I remember God. I've been here before. You helped me then and I trust you're going to help me now. For you've been my help and in the shadow of your wings, I'll sing for joy. David says, you've got me. Your hands are all over me. This season hurts, but I'm safe. And that's what I want you to know. God's got you. He's done it before and he'll do it again, which leads to my final point. When life is discouraging, trust God. Seek God, praise God, remember God, trust God. David says, But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They'll be given over to the power of the sword. They'll be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God and all who swear by him shall exult for the mouths of liars will be stopped. I want you to remember that in this story, David is being pursued by real enemies. Okay, there are real physical enemies, people who are seeking to take his life. And we read in 2 Samuel 17 that as soon as his enemies learn that he's wearied and discouraged, they they begin to plot even harder against him. They say, I'll come upon him when he's weary and discouraged and throw him into a panic. And all the people who are with him will flee and I'll strike down only the king. You know, maybe your season of discouragement involves physical enemies. Maybe it involves people who have set themselves up against you. Well, the good news, according to David, is that God will fight for you. The good news, according to David, is that you're not alone. The good news, according to David, is that God has you're back. And if you were re- to read the rest of this narrative, you would see that in David's case, a great battle ensued and David did in fact come out victorious. He trusted that God would make him victorious before it even happened. And God came through. The time in the cave was just a season. But even if you don't have physical enemies, I want you to remember that you do have a spiritual enemy. And this enemy would love to pounce on you when you're weary and discouraged. This enemy would love to see you destroyed in the flames. Like a good predator, he's after the isolated and weak and discouraged pray. And when you get yourself in your own head and you stop trusting God and you believe this is the end, it will be. Because Satan will pounce. And that's why Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, he says, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You guys ever seen Discovery Channel? Animal Planet. My wife hates these scenes. But we get some glimpses of how predators bring dinner home for the family. And they go after the weak one. 
They go after the tired one. They go after the one who has disconnected from the pack. And once they see it, it's over. The reason discouragement is such a big deal is because that is how, that's where we could find ourselves at times. When discouragement sits in and we, we stop seeking God and we stop praising God and we start cursing God and we live in, our, in, a, in a, just a, a world of negativity and we isolate ourselves, we become so vulnerable and all that happens is we spiral further and further and further and further and further into darkness. I began this sermon by saying that the flames of life's furnace can only produce two things. They can destroy you or they can purify you. They can turn you to nothing or they can strengthen you. It's up to you though. You have a choice. If you're in the middle of a trial, you have a choice to trust God or to turn your back on him. You have a choice to believe that he's sovereign and that he's good even when it's hard or to throw up your hands and give up. But the difference between being destroyed and being purified is all about where you place your trust. You see, Satan would love to see this furnace be the source of your destruction, but God would love to turn it into a time of purification and growth. The question is, do you trust him? Because if you do, you will find that this trial is just another lesson on your way to glory. Band, you guys could go ahead and come out. In conclusion, I just want to say a couple of things. The first is I want you to know today, if you came in here this morning and you just felt like, God, I just need a breath of fresh air. I feel like I'm drowning. I just, I'm gasping for air. Give me something. I want you to know without a doubt, God's not done with you yet. You may be tempted to think that you're alone, but you're not. You may be tempted to think that you're the only one who goes through these things, but you're not. Don't lose hope. The fire may rage, but you will find out that you can come out purified on the other side. God's fingerprints are all over you. I shared this message today because I just felt like, you know what, maybe... God, maybe there are some people who just need a lifeline. They just need that reminder that they're not, this isn't the end. And I share that with sincerity because I know that there's a rising trend in our culture where when these days come, what do people do? They bail out in the worst way possible. They just decide to end it. And it's become epidemic in our culture, where discouragement and frustration and anxiety is causing people to just end it. They give up. They feel like they'll never escape, but it's a lie from the pit of hell. God's not done with you. He's not done with your kids. He's not done with your marriage. You're frustrated, you're discouraged. He's not done. Do not give up. Do not turn your back. Remember God, praise God, seek God, trust God, because in all the pressing, in all the burning, in all the crushing, God is doing something beautiful. And he's gonna teach you something in this that he could never teach you anywhere else. And then his expectation for you is to take that lesson and to share your story with the world because you're not alone and others need to know that God is for them and not against them. When life is a furnace, seek God. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for reminding us that it's never over. We're not alone. 
discouragement is a season. You've offered life, living water, Jesus. You could strengthen us in ways that we never knew could even happen. For those who are tired, for those who are weary, I pray that they would be not be tempted to give up. I pray that it would pull them closer to you. I pray, God, that we would see that in our hardest times, even when the flames are burning, the furnace is just purifying. And we're gonna come out stronger. We're gonna see beauty that we never knew existed because you're there. And thank you, Jesus, for being the example of suffering and keeping your eyes on the Father, even when it was hard. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.